The problem is most to-do lists are just, um, they're more capture lists where you've captured things that have your attention, but they still need some clarification and organization. So many people write down things like doctor or tooth or bank or VP of finance or board meeting or whatever. They write it down, which is great. That's actually step one, which is to capture things that have your attention. But then it's very necessary that you go to the next step, which is you clarify exactly what you're going to do about those things, if anything. Hey guys, today we have a special guest with us. He's David Allen. David Allen is widely recognized as the world's leading expert on personal and organizational productivity. He is the originator of GTD, the groundbreaking getting things done methodology that has shown millions how to transform a fast paced, overwhelming, overcommitted life into one that is balanced, integrated, relaxed and has more successful outcomes. His 30 year pioneering research and coaching to corporate managers and CEOs of some of the America's most prestigious corporations and institutions has earned him Forbes recognition as one of the top five executive coaches in the United States and Time called his flagship book, Getting Things Done, the definitive business self-help book of the decade. I'm very happy to invite David Allen to the show. Thanks, David, for coming to the show. Sure. PNS, delighted to be here. Thanks for the invitation. Before we go into the questions, can you share where can people connect with you, David? Well, our website, gettingthingsdone.com, uh, has all the information about who we are. Most of our work is supporting licensees and partners around the world. We have a great partner, uh, <clears throat> Calm Achiever in India, that does that we've certified to deliver our trainings and coaching. So people can find them there. If you look under training and coaching and then click on the country uh, or just write in India, you'll see how to connect with those folks. And uh, otherwise, I'm GTD guy on Twitter and I'm D Allen 45 on Instagram. So if you want to connect in with me personally and then see what my world is like in those regards, that's you're, you're welcome to do that. Thank you, David. David, my first question is that can you briefly explain what is GTD? Sure. It's a set of best practices that allow you to get more space in your head to focus on the most meaningful things. So it's how do I eliminate the distractions that usually get in the way of that? How do I maintain a clear consciousness uh, amidst uh, all the agreements and commitments that I've made with myself and with other people? So it's a way to get basically uh, get control of the inventory of all your commitments. So you can surf on top of that, see it from the larger picture on a regular basis, stay current with it and feel comfortable about your choices about what you do. David, you always say that the brain is not good for holding ideas, but having ideas. Can yeah. you explain that? Well, cognitive science has basically proven that the, the your short-term memory can hold basically four things before you start uh, sub-optimizing your cognitive ability. You start to not be able to remember stuff as well, not be able to think strategically as well, not be able to be as creative as you could be if you got more than four things going on. If you're still using your head as your office, and most people are. Most people have all kinds of commitments just banging around in there, waking them up at three o'clock in the morning, worrying, uh, complaining, all kinds of stuff that are you know pretty ineffective and unproductive behaviors. So yeah, and, you know, basically I discovered that 35 years ago, but the last 10 years, the cognitive scientists have basically validated that that's true. And they could prove it. David, why do most to-do list systems do not work? Hmm. Well, they work as long as you work them appropriately. But the problem is most to-do lists are just, um, they're more capture lists where you've captured things that have your attention, but they still need some clarification and organization. So many people write down things like doctor or tooth or bank or VP of finance or board meeting or whatever. They write it down, which is great. That's actually step one, which is to capture things that have your attention. But then it's very necessary that you go to the next step, which is you clarify exactly what you're going to do about those things, if anything. And there's two questions to answer for that. What's the next action on bank? 
What's the next action on your tooth? And if one action won't complete it, what's the project you need to keep track of? So action and outcome become, that's really the zeros and ones. It's the, the ultimate reduction of what productive behavior is. What are you trying to produce, either as an experience or a material thing? And how do you need to allocate or reallocate your attention and your focus and your activities to make that happen? And most people avoid those decisions, like the plague. And then what happens is they look at a to-do list and it just reminds them of decisions they haven't made yet. And they can, they can create as much stress as they relieve. So that's the why most to-do lists don't work. They're, you know, major, um, uh, <laughs> they're major list of very undoable things. Uh, so anyway, that's why most of them don't work. David, you suggest people to say yes to every opportunity. What do you mean by that? I don't know that I ever said say yes to every opportunity. I think you need to be aware of the opportunities that you have in front of you and then decide which ones you want to say yes to and which ones you don't. So there are opportunities that you want to take advantage of right now and have an action about right now. There are opportunities that you might want to go, that you might want to put on a someday maybe list. That's a really cool thing to do, but I don't have the time or resources right now to move on it, but I don't want to lose the idea. Someday maybe list can be very creative in terms of the things that you think about. You don't, don't lose any good ideas, in other words. I think that's maybe what I said. Shouldn't lose the idea, but doesn't necessarily mean you need to commit to it or move on it. You need to put it in its appropriate category. And there are some things you think of and you go, what a dumb idea. You don't need to do that at all. Or if it ever shows up just naturally or organically, then fine, I'll deal with it then, but I don't need to keep track of it. So those are the different kind of categories of things that pop into your head that might be what you mean by opportunities. David, you say that uh, don't make our day a surprise. Can you explain that? Well, most of your day is going to be a surprise, meaning you don't know what's coming toward you. And so what you want to, what you don't want to do is to overstructure or overplan. So you're not flexible enough to deal with the new things coming in you don't expect. In the old days, I haven't seen a statistic in a long time, BNS, but in the old days, they used to say 40% of your day is going to be a surprise. So if you try to schedule more than 40%, more than 60% of your day, you're going to be feeling overwhelmed by things you didn't expect that you still need to deal with. So, you know, I've talked about the three, there's, there's the, the three different kinds of things you may be doing during the day. One is doing stuff you already told yourself you need to do. So there's an action list of errands to run, things to talk to people about, things that you need to do at the computer. And then there's stuff that comes at you you don't expect. You could, some people call them surprises. There are no surprises, they're just mismanaged inputs. But they're, you know, emails you didn't expect. Somebody walks in and tells you something or gives you something you need to do or think you want to do. And so many times a lot of what you do is stuff that's not on any list. It just shows up and you do, you do it when it shows up because it's a priority against all the other stuff. And then the third thing you need to do is define what the work is that should be on your list. And that's going to take you 30 to 90 minutes a day just to deal with the new inputs coming in and clarifying what the work is embedded in them so that you can trust your list is complete. See, if your lists are not complete or if you have a backlog of unclarified, unorganized stuff, any new input's going to feel like a pain. Because even if it's a good good thing, because you don't know what's still lurking in the backlog that might be more important than whatever this new thing is. So new things bother you. So that's why when I'm not doing anything else, I'm cleaning up all my backlog to zero because there's stuff coming at me I can't expect. And, and I like the freedom to be spontaneous and to deal with those things as they show up. But you don't have the freedom to do that if you have a lot of uncaptured, unclarified, unorganized stuff you know, hanging around in your world that you've let come in. David, how to deal with interruptions? Well, again, there are no interruptions. They're just mismanaged inputs. So you have to decide, is the input, is the input that you're getting part of your job and your responsibility and your accountability? If it is, life's like that. If you don't like it, change jobs. You know, so that's, you know, if you're in customer service or if you work for the fire department or whatever, you get all kinds of stuff coming at you that it's part of your job to deal with that as it comes at you, right? And so you have to decide, is that true? 
or is somebody just bothering you because they don't have a system and they just want to interrupt you and dump it onto you as opposed to sending you an email about it? In which case, stop them. Say, Hi, that's really interesting, probably important stuff. Please send me an email about that. Otherwise, it's going to go into the vacuum you know, and disappear. So either you need the input or you don't. If you don't, stop it. If you do, it's part of your job. Right. The problem is, again, most people have such a big backlog of stuff, they don't know what to do with it. And not only that, a lot of people don't trust their own personal self-management systems. So they, the, when something comes at them and they know they probably should, would, could, should, ought to do it as part of their job, uh, and they don't know how to track that. In other words, write a note and put it in your own in-basket you know, about what you need to do so that you know you can loop around to it later on when you might have time to do it. Then what happens is people say, okay, I have to go do it right now because I don't have a way to track it. And then they get pissed off because they think somebody's bothered them. Well, whose fault was that? You know, so, you know, it's it, once you have a good personal system, it doesn't mean you have to like all the new inputs or surprises that you get, but you don't have to feel bothered by them. In other words, manage them appropriately. David, you have written in the book uh, that uh, make it up, make it happen. Can you explain that? Well, you know, most of your life you made up and then made it happen, right? You wouldn't be talking to me if you didn't have some sort of crazy idea at some point. You wanted to do stuff like that, and then you made it happen, right? So I'm not telling you anything you didn't, you, you don't already do all the time. As a matter of fact, even just getting out of the room, if you want to get out of the room, you make it up. I want to be out of the room, great. And you, what do you do? You make it happen. You start moving on that vision. So it's really about just being clear about what the visions are you have and then moving toward them to manifest them. David, can you explain what is a two-minute tool? Sure. Once you decide what the very next action is you need to take on anything you're committed to do, if you can do that action within two minutes in the context you're sitting in or standing in right, right then, you're better off to do it right then because it would take you longer to, and more energy to track it and remind yourself about it than to finish it right at that moment. So two minute rule is golden. It's great. I've had a lot of executives tell me it's worth the whole price of the whole consulting I did with them just for the two minute rule if they didn't have it already because it just sort of makes them Teflon in and out. Stuff comes in and out. You shouldn't let stuff hang around that you could actually complete or finish or move forward to the next step in less than two minutes. Silly. David, what is the importance of uh, weekly review? Well, once a week you need to catch up. I mean, the world comes at all of us a lot faster than you can keep it, you know, cleanly organized and clarified. Uh, but you need every once in a while to make sure you have an oasis where you hold the world back and catch up, pull up the rear guard, as I say. Uh, you know, everybody listening or watching this probably has had stuff show up in the last two or three or four days that they know they're committed to do something about or clarify or resolve or handle but they probably haven't yet taken time to figure out what exactly that project is or what to do about it next. So when are they going to do that? You have to build in reflection time and, you know, stare at your navel, figure out what you want to do with your life, you know, walk around the Rose garden, figure out, you know, you know, all you can do all kinds of meditative and reflective exercises, which are great. You know, I do them too, but that's different. The, the weekly review is more an operational review where you step back, not too far from all the stuff that you've been engaged in. You need to maintain a project list. You know, I talk about that in getting things done, and very few people have one. A project with the broad definition of anything that's going to take more than one action step uh, that you, can, you can't finish in one sitting, you know, we would call a project. So get your tooth fixed. Hire the vice president. Uh, you know, see if you can research whether you can increase your credit line at the bank. Uh, you know, handle your mother-in-law's visit that's coming up. You know, those are projects by my definition. And most people have somewhere between 30 and 100 of those. If you include all the personal stuff in your life, get tires on your car, handle your mother-in-law's visit, you know, the, you know, yada, yada, yada. And so that's the list that needs to be reviewed weekly. Not every day. You don't have time every day. You know, things are coming at us too fast and people are usually too busy to be looking at all of that all the time. But you can't let it slide too long. So every seven days we've found that's really when you need to catch up. And that's what allows you to keep a viable system. It allows you to then manage the external brain, which, of course, I champion, that you build all this stuff out of your head uh, and that, that you keep the system current. But as soon as your system, as soon as your list is incomplete, you won't have the energy or motivation to maintain them. 
So if you're not doing some sort of weekly catch up and getting your list and, and, and your inventory of your stuff current, you'll fall off this wagon pretty fast. The good news is that you can get back on pretty fast. You know, all you have to do is do it again, get it out of your head, decide actions and outcomes, park those things on appropriate lists, then you're, then you're back in the game. David, you talk about Inbox Zero. Can you explain that? Well, sure. Is your mailbox full of stuff you just never taken out of it? Is your garbage can full of stuff you've never taken out of it? What's the difference between that and your email? What, 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 what's the difference between that and your briefcase or your, or your pack, right? Why do you let stuff lie around in there? Either it shouldn't get in there to begin with, or you should get rid of it or reorganize it or move it out of there somewhere so that you've got a clean capture tool. So in basket zero doesn't mean that you finish everything that's in your in baskets, whether that's digital or otherwise, it just means that you've organized, you've clarified them appropriately and organized them. You know, is that reference? Is that trash? Is that an actionable thing I need to keep track of on my list, et cetera? So it's just managing all the inputs that you have so that you're, you've got a clean collection or capture function functionality. And a lot of people listening or watching this are probably using their email in basket as their organization tool, right? And then what happens is they have stuff they still need to think about, stuff they need to decide about, stuff they need to be reminded about, stuff they need to do about any of that stuff. It's very easy for people to go numb psychologically about all that, simply because they've got, there's so many different kinds of things in there and they have to keep resorting it every time they look at it. So you can clean it up pretty fast, just create different categories. That's reference, goes in my reference file. That's, a, that's, a, that's something I can finish in two minutes, let me finish it. That's something I don't need at all, delete it. What's left might be things that are going to take you longer than a couple of minutes you need to handle, in which case you could just create an action folder in your email and just move those things over there. So that, that allows you to then use your email in basket truly as an in basket, not as some sort of reference, reminder, crap, trash bin, you know, to-do lists, you know, combination of all those things. And, you know, if you never let your email get more than a screen full, you're fine. You know, sometimes mine mount up right now. I've probably got about 15 or 20 right now in my email. I just checked and that's okay. I'm going to, I'm going to get to the bottom of that before the end of the day anyway. So it doesn't bother me at all. David, uh, you say that we need to make action decisions when we are smart so that when we are dumb, we do smart things. Can you explain that to the audience? Sure. If you ever put anything in front of the door in the morning, so you wouldn't forget it in the morning. That's what I'm talking about. You know, the night before you said, okay, I better remember to take this to the office or to the meeting in the morning and you stick it somewhere, you know, so that you won't miss it, you know, because some part of you is probably smart enough the night before to realize that whoever's going to walk through the door may be dumb and unconscious in the morning. So then you do a smart, you know, you, you made a smart decision, put stuff in the right place, and then you didn't have to be smart to do a smart thing, right? If you ever, if you ever made a grocery list, you know, you sit down, you're going to have a party, you're going to have, you have a little celebration. And so you and your life partner sit down and make a list of all the stuff you need to buy at the store. And that's, you're being smart, you're being creative, you park the stuff on a list. So the next day you can be kind of dumb and thick and stupid and go do a lot of smart things. You just go do the stuff on the list, right? So in a way that kind of like, duh, of course, you know, that's why those kind of things work. David, what is the importance of relaxation? Well, you can move faster when you're relaxed. What do you see athletes doing before they go perform at some high level? Stretching, relaxing, breathing. Why? They'll perform better. Right? So, uh, you know, I got a black belt in karate when I was in my 20s. And one of the things you learned is that a tense muscle is a slow one. All I have to do is, if I'm sparring with you, BNS, all I have to do is make you tense right? Then you're not going to be as fast as I am because the, the, the power in a karate punch, punch comes from speed, not muscle, right? But again, you're faster the more relaxed you are. So you can take that then into life that says, hey, the more relaxed you are, the more your brain can think functionally, the more that, you, that you're going to make good strategic decisions. Um, 
when you're stressed or pressured, yeah, sure, you'll make some good decisions and you'll to try to get out of your situation. But it's a lot easier and a lot better and you'll probably make better decisions if you remember your mom's birthday two weeks ahead of her birthday as opposed to the day after her birthday. It's David. David, uh, you always ask, have you envisioned wild success lately? What do you mean by that? Well, quite simply, have you envisioned wild success lately? You know, it's like, hey, what would you like to have true in your life? You know, in these days, especially with the pandemic going on, it seems a bit irrational for or, or counterintuitive for people to be focusing on positive outcomes. But I would say, well, come on. Yes, you need to do a worst case scenario. You need to sit down and say, how bad could it be? And can you deal with that? And at the same time, you need to say, and how good could it be? And then you shoot down the middle. So you don't want to dwell on the negative, for sure. But you need to accept that it's the possibility of it so that some part of you gets rid of your fear about it. And then you have much more freedom to actually focus on what wild success would look like. And wild success doesn't necessarily mean lots of money. It could be a happy, relaxed, having a balanced lifestyle, having time to spend with my kids, having, being able to paint, being able to dance, being able to play the flute or whatever. You know, it could be any number of those things, not just necessarily material stuff. It's as, just as important to focus on wild success in terms of how you feel and what experience internally you're after. I want a sense of freedom. I want a sense of confidence that what I'm doing is the right thing I need to be doing. I want a sense of, of clarity and control relative to my network and the people that I engage with closely. Any and all of that. Yes, David. David, you recommend people to be unreasonably joyful. Can you talk about that? Well, it's pretty much the same thing. You know, oftentimes it'd be very hard for a lot of people to say, in the situation I'm in, I should be joyful. And I say, well, try it. You know, and at least give yourself 30 seconds to say, what would, what would I, what could I actually be joyful about right now? Because if you have a sense of joy, and I don't mean necessarily happy or giddy or laughing kind of joy, I'm talking about more of a, a deeper sense of satisfaction, essentially, you know, with your life and what's going on and the possibilities. And so, you know, being un, sometimes you just have to convince yourself, as I say, I've had an affirmation for years about I am unreasonably joyful because there are many times it doesn't feel like being joyful at all. And so just to move past that and actually move myself into that psychological state um, trains me a lot, gives me strength. David, what apps do you recommend uh, for other people to become more productive? Any kind of a list manager you need. You know, there are hundreds, if not thousands out there. You know, you could use Excel. You could just use make lists in Word. You could use, and there are hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of apps that have been built even around getting things done by methodology. And they're basically all just list managers. How can I manage a list of errands I need to run, a list of things to talk to my boss about, a list of things that I need to do at the computer, a list of creative uh, things I want to write? Uh, you know, so just all you need is some sort of external list manager, and that could be low-tech, mid-tech or high-tech. Low-tech would just be writing notes and throwing them into a folder. You know, mid-tech would be keeping a list on a notebook or a paper planner in some way. High-tech would be certainly using any of the digital tools that are out there that you can make lists with. Does it, the, the, the tool that works best is the one that you will work, right? So you need to ask yourself, if you're trying to set up a system for yourself and implement the getting things done methodology, ask yourself, how would you make a list right now? And you, what you don't want to do is try to learn 14 new technologies, you know, because that'll frustrate you and, you know, you won't stick with it. Uh, you need to use kind of whatever you have and then morph and migrate it. If you're doing weekly reviews, then you constantly be sort of challenging and upgrading your system and refining it so that it works better for you. It took me at least six months to figure out how to organize Evernote just for reference material because it's so, you know, the, the bad news about apps like that is they're so simple you know I was just talking to a friend of mine who uses OneNote a lot you know in Microsoft and he said the good news is it's so simple the bad news is it's so simple right so you have to figure out your own formulas your own heuristic your own structures you know uh, out of all that how do you use it and that's fine it just it's going to take a while to do that so that you feel comfortable so you need to start at least come up with a, a basic starting point you know and then you know refine it from there 
David, now we have questions from subscribers. Uh, Rand, okay. Randy is asking, can you give some tips for students? Yeah, students are kind of a different thing. Uh, I just talked to a student. I just interviewed uh, a, a kid who's 17. Um, smart, smart kid. Uh, and he's been using GTD since his dad started doing it about two or three years ago. So he kind of gets it. So I asked him, I said, so how do you manage that? And he said, well, I have a whole tab about school stuff. And I, I keep track of the things because in school you have a lot of deadlines. I need to turn in that report by X. I need to, you know, do this research by X or whatever. And he said he uses his calendar for that and then reviews it regularly to see what's coming toward him in that way. And then defines his next actions he needs to take in order to do it. And sometimes you need to time block where you need to block out an hour or two because you can see this deadline coming toward you. And if you don't spend an hour working on that spreadsheet or that plan or that report or whatever it is you need to do, then you need to block that in. So students, it's a little bit different because to some degree the world is structured for students and giving them you know, a lot of these things that they're not self-defining themselves. They just need to keep track of what those commitments are that are coming at them and then step back and be able to have some sort of a systematic way to see the whole picture. You know, what, which rep how many reports you are due by the end of this month or next week or whatever and to be able to see that game and then they'll, they'll make smarter decisions about you know, sort of how to organize their week or their day. And by the way, by the way, you know, last year we published Getting Things Done for Teens, for teenagers. So if that you might want to, if you haven't seen that book yet or, or read it, it's a lot easier to read and get into than, my, than Getting Things Done, which is kind of a big manual of a lot of stuff that might seem a little overwhelming. But we, we you know, I had two co-authors, they have kids and one of them's a teacher and the, we wrote it with sort of the language that a teenager or somebody in their early 20s could they respond to very well. Even a number of adults have seen it and said, wow, that makes, that's, I like that book, you know, it really works for me. So there's a suggestion. Thank you, David. David, uh, Linda is asking, I am overwhelmed with so many tasks. What should be my first action? The one that will relieve pressure the most. Which one of those things, if they were done or completed, would give you the best feeling, would, would move the needle more for whatever it is that you want to be doing? Sometimes, sometimes I do the thing that's the hardest so I can sort of you know, reward myself the rest of the day by snacking on email and doing other things. Sometimes I do the thing that's just the most fun and the easiest so that it gets my energy up. So I, don't, I think either one of those is probably okay. Just keep moving. Don't, don't hang up and then do nothing and just avoid your list and avoid your stuff to do. You're better off doing something that may not be ultimately the most strategic thing to do, but at least get you moving. So that's how I, that's, and, and I figured that's how I set my priorities because I have a huge value about having a clear head and being present. So I'm asking myself, what do I need to do to get more present? So I usually say, well, what most has my attention, right? And then how do I relieve that and get that off my mind? So that's how I do it. David, would you like to share a seven day challenge to our viewers? Sure. Hey, the next seven days, see how clear you can get your head. See how many things you can get off your mind, not by avoiding them or not by just meditating or drinking. You know, you can do either one of those. You just leave your mind for both in both of those conditions. But while you're thinking, how do you get stuff that's got your attention off your mind and you have to capture, clarify, organize, you know, that stuff in some sort of external brain. So see in the next seven days how clear and how clean you can get your head. And you don't have to go very far. Just notice what has your attention and then write it down, decide actions and outcomes or what you're going to do about it, if anything, park the results of that on some trusted list manager that you have somewhere, even if it's just temporary and then see how you feel. And then uh, by the end of seven days, decide whether you want to keep doing this or whether this was totally silly and not worth it. Thank you, David. David, uh, before we leave, can you once again share where can people connect with you so that they will remember it better? Sure, gettingthingsdone.com. You can go there. There's lots of stuff to surf around there. There's a free newsletter we have that has a podcast. Uh, you, obviously, you can buy Getting Things Done 
you know, the art of stress-free productivity at any good bookstore. I'm sure they can get it or get it for you. And that's the manual about all of this. We also just wrote uh, the Getting Things Done workbook. So if you're brand new to this and you wanted to really get started and find an easy way to start to implement all of this, the Getting Things Done workbook has sort of 10 major steps to go through. They're not hard to do. Uh, and that may be an easy start point for a lot of people if you can get the Getting Things Done workbook wherever you are. But, you know, you can get it from Amazon or wherever, whatever your books, they can order it for you anyway. Thank you, David. Thank you once again for coming to the show. Uh, it was a pleasure to talk with you. Sure. It was fun. Thanks for the invitation. Good luck, everybody. Subscribe to BNS Goku Great. <laughs>